Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel Denniston and I'm here with Kevin Wallace, director of the Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts. Tonight we are going to learn more about the artist Beatrice Wood through the lens of esteemed art historian and cultural anthropologist Stephen Heiler. Stephen Heiler is an art historian, cultural anthropologist, photographer, and author conducting a lifelong survey of the India's sacred art and crafts and their meanings within rural society. He has spent an average of four months each year during the last 44 years traveling in Indian villages, documenting craftsmanship and contemporary traditions. Heiler has served as a consultant and guest curator for more than 25 museum exhibitions of Indian art, including shows at the Smithsonian, Arthur M. Sackler Gallery, the American Museum of Natural History, the Museum of International Folk Art, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, the Houston Museum of Natural Science, and Mingay International Museum. Tyler is acknowledged as one of the leading documentary photographers of India, and his image archive is recognized as one of the most extensive and valuable in existence. A prolific author, he has published six books, Village India, Painted Prayers, Women's Art in Village India, Gifts of Earth, Terracottas and Clay Sculptures of India, Meeting God, Elements of Hindu Devotion, Daughters of India, Art and Identity, and Sonabai, Another Way of Seeing. Dr. Heiler lives in Camden, Maine, although he spends several months each winter in India. During the rest of the year, he frequently travels to lecture in universities and museums throughout the US and UK. Thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. This leads us to our first question. You have known Beatrice Wood pretty much your entire life. Can you share how she came to be part of your life? There's no part, there's no time when I didn't know Beatrice. Um, I was a tiny, when I was born, uh, two or 300 yards from her house. She, I'm sure, didn't know me. I was just one of the little brats that, you know, went by her house uh, until, and I, I remember her distinctly, uh, uh, until I was 18 and asked her for a job. However, I wanted to say um, before that, um, before I began to work for her, my grandfather, um, who was a famous chocolate maker, had, um, been a friend of Beatrice's in Ojai, and he, she had flirted with him, as she does with many men, or did with many men, uh, outrageously, and my grandmother was extremely jealous of her, never quite forgave her, and uh, my father uh, and my parents, who, as I said, lived very close by at the Thatcher School, uh, my father was a, a fairly good photographer, and he, uh, he worked out trades with her where he did some of her first or early studio photography of her work that are the photographs that are in old brochures, et cetera, of her. Uh, and then she uh, traded him and gave him vessels. Uh, I have one really beautiful one. Maybe I have two. I have two beautiful ones that had come down through my family uh, that were part of that trade. Um, not here in Maine, but in, we have a small house in Ojai, and so we've kept them there. Um, so that, that's that part. And then when I was uh, 18, I had longish hair and uh, was always an iconoclast, a little unusual, and it didn't fit into the uh, maintenance crew that I was working on at the Thatcher School. And I quit um, unceremoniously, much to my parents' absolute dismay, and needed a job. And so I went up to Beatrice in a local market, Toby's, which is now where the Rainbow Bridge is in Ojai, and uh, asked her if she could use any help. And she hired me as her gardener and to work in her studio. So I worked with her uh, that first summer when I was 18. and. Uh, it did help with the garden. It was a largely a cactus garden, but there were roses and other things and helped clean the beds and water, et cetera. And then I worked in her studio, mostly just wedging clay. She taught me how to wedge clay. And um, I, I mean, I cleaned, you know, I, but I was so totally besotted with her at age 18. We're talking about in 19, beginning of 1970. Um, and I just could not get enough of her. And she would sit we would, in her house in Ohio, on Macandrew Road, the older house. 
she had a breezeway between her studio and behind her studio was the garage and the kitchen and then going into her dining room and living room and bedroom. And uh, in that breezeway was a day bed and behind the day bed was the sculpture that's directly behind me. And Beatrice, that's where Beatrice sat after her work, uh, before her work when she was having coffee in the morning, but that's where she was most comfortable outside unless it was raining or very cold. And she would sit there and I would sit with her on the day bed, just totally entranced. Her stories, her, she was, really one of the most consummate storytellers I've ever known. And at age 18, I couldn't believe what she was telling me. It, it just seemed so not, it wasn't, I did believe her, but they were just so remarkable about growing up in um, New York, but also spending time in, in, in Paris as a young girl and then, you know, persuading her mother to let her have a studio in G Giverny and watching Monet paint. And then as she grew and became part of a, the New York art scene very young, she would use names, but she would never use, she didn't name drop ever. So she wouldn't say, I knew Duchamp uh, or, you know, um, Picabio, she would say, uh, Marcel and I did this and there. Marcel encouraged me to draw in his studio, whatever it might be, or uh, all these different people that I had studied art history and wanted to spend my life documenting art. But it took me a while to put two and two together. Uh, it didn't, I didn't realize at first the, the, the fame of the people that she spoke about. And then when I did, you know, you can imagine, I was just, I was spellbound. I didn't get a lot of work done, I have to say. I, I, I really didn't. And during that summer, I, she would coax me. She was wonderful at coaxing people out of their shells, such as they were in my case. I, I was far more shy at that time. And so I told her what I really wanted to do was travel and document art, uh, particularly tribal art, folk art, craft. Well, that was right in line with her interests. And she told me that, I, to me, it couldn't have been anywhere in the world. She told me that India was a wide open field and that I could, um, I could find uh, a lot, I could spend a life uh, documenting, working with the people of India, whom she then explained that she really had fallen in love with. That she, and she told me many stories of the Indian people that she had met, both people at the higher level and people at what Indians would consider very low level. Uh, and she really persuaded me that that would be something that could be a career for me, and then invited me to go to India with her. With her. And I was just floored. So uh, the thought of going to India with her was beyond belief. Uh, I, you probably do have other questions and I, I could just keep going, but- um, Yeah, you uh, hit on some, but let's backtrack just a tiny bit. Um, so, you know, you mentioned a little bit about your initial impression of her. Um, so how did that change over the course of your friendship? I was never not spellbound by her. I was always intrigued by her stories. I always loved what she had to tell me uh, and I could hear them again and again. The more that I knew Beatrice, the more I was captivated by her wisdom, by her remarkable intelligence, by her, uh, by her honesty, her ruthless self-honesty. And that had a tremendous effect on me and how I've chosen to, to, to try to be in my life. So it was really how that grew was the stories, yes, she had an incredible sense of humor. And yes, she was a performer as people know. And yes, she had a quality that was, you know, just delightful and provo provocative. But beneath that, beyond that, much larger than that was this deep 
deep-rooted philosophy of life that intrigued me and which was infectious and which has helped me with my entire life and my career. So she, I've had many mentors in my life and most of them have been women, but Beatrice is the core of that. She is the person for whom I uh, thank for my entire career, which incidentally in India is now 50 years. Um, so. I love that. So you've said Beatrice would introduce you to India. What she was did. her idea of India like at that point in time? And why did she encourage you to study Indian art and culture? Well, Beatrice had been there twice and she had been traveling uh, first as a guest of a, a truly great Indian woman who had just come to her studio and seen her work and thought that, and invited Beatrice to India. Uh, and then, an, an, anyway, she, she knew some truly great Indian women. And at that point, uh, she traveled in India documenting her, with a, a show of her work and talking about the place of her work within the greater world of, of Indian craftsmanship, I mean, of American craftsmanship. She returned a second time for the um, uh, USIS, the uh, United States Information Service to, uh, to travel through India and lecture about American craftsmanship because she was so popular the first time. But in both cases, she was able to, because of her own engaging quality and her own insistence that she see people uh, off the beaten track, uh, she really did. And she engaged with, met many, many Indians that had had little contact with foreigners and including craftspeople. She really wanted to meet artists and craftspeople. And so she, she, she did that. So her experience was unusual already. And because of that, she knew that my interest is in folk arts and crafts. She encouraged me to come and find out for myself. So, uh, it, it, and then she introduced me to those great, truly great Indian women. Um, the one who had invited her initially that I met on my first day in Delhi was Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, which is a, sounds like a mouthful to American ears, but is a name which is familiar to virtually all Indians. Uh, Kamla Devi was the right hand of Gandhi and was the person who set up his entire cottage industries program, his crafts cooperatives everywhere in the country. So Beatrice had her first trip was through Kamla Devi. Through Kamla Devi, Beatrice met remarkable leaders in the craft world. When Beatrice introduced me to Kamla Devi, then Kamla Devi asked me uh, to bring back a map uh, the next day uh, in which I, I was planning to spend seven months traveling by myself in different regions of India. Beatrice and I were only together for several weeks in India and I was going to be there seven months. So I brought back a map, a National Geographic map that was in my backpack, backpack and was very creased by this point because I'd come overland from, by local transport from Paris to get to India. And uh, I took a pen and marked where I wanted to go all around the subcontinent and put little circles around the places I wanted to stay. This was at her request. She gave me, this is Kama Devi, places to stay everywhere I went, homes to stay in. And they were the homes of remarkably fine Indian artists and artisans and craftspeople, but also or, and or the people that founded the crafts movement in India through Kamla Devi. So it, it, I know no one, literally, I know no one who has been given that type of introduction to India or that opportunity. Most people who go meet a few people, stay in some homes maybe if they're lucky, um, but I stayed in probably 40 that first year, maybe more, and that has been the basis of what I do. And I did travel with Beatrice uh, for a few weeks and um, that was delightful. She was, you know, already, this is 1971. So she was already quite elderly, uh, I guess 
that would make her 79 that year. And she was having physical problems, but we, um, I, I actually took her because I'd been studying India for a year prior to leaving. Um, I took her to villages that I'd found out about that had fabulous terracotta sculptures in them, just extraordinary. And uh, were horses, terracotta horses placed under sacred trees and Beatrice loved them as much as I did. I hadn't seen them before. I'd just seen the photographs of them. And we went into those places. At one time, she was, uh, we were shown into a, a government, uh, not a government guest house, a um, corporate guest house for a property that had these shrines on it. They were a lignite mine, and but on this gigantic, vast tract of land, there were some old terracotta shrines on it that had been abandoned because the village had been moved that had been there. And we went to go see those, but we stayed in a guest house and we were ushered into a um, same bedroom, uh, which had a big bed in it and which the guest house um, manager proudly told us Nehru had slept in, the, uh, the prime minister of India. And we kept our laughter to ourselves until he left and then just cracked up that I at 20 and she at 79 would be without blinking, be put into the same room, the same bedroom. And then after we'd finished laughing our you know, sides off, I went and asked if I could have another room. And um, I just didn't, we didn't want to embarrass him. And, uh, but she has, Beatrice has created uh, a number of drawings of uh, us in Nehru's bedroom uh, in flagrante, having great, um, great fun together sexually. And um, that was, um, I hate to admit it really didn't happen, but uh, it didn't, but it was, she had a great imagination. And so one of those uh, is on my wall of our house actually framed one of those drawings. I have a lot of her drawings. I love hearing this. Um, we're gonna go back to more of your India stories soon. Um, but can you share about the influence of India on Beatrice Wood prior to her first trip there? As a theosophist, she was likely more aware of India in terms of philosophy and her lifelong friendship with Rukmini Devi Arundale, though she did collect art books all of her life and had an interest in art history from wide ranging cultures. Did India, in your perspective, have an impact on her identity and work prior to her first trip there? Not as strongly as it did after her first trip. Uh, she was um, truly uh, struck by the philosophies of Jiddu Krishnamurti. When Beatrice was in her 20s and uh, early 30s, she uh, followed his work, studied him, uh, and was deeply affected by him. But Krishnamurti is not, was not a common Indian. He was, he was a total iconoclast who eschewed Indian ritual and Indian traditional beliefs. Um, and so in that way, yes, she was drawn to Indian philosophy in some ways, but not what would be traditional Indian philosophy. Uh, and uh, knew she did study theosophy and in studying theosophy, she studied Hindu texts and Buddhist texts and Muslim and um, Zoroastrian and um, Tao, et cetera. She was interested in broad, broadly interested in philosophies, esoteric philosophies, as well as just core religious philosophies and could discuss anything um, knowledgeably. She was remarkably well uh, learned. But um, no, I think she was not deeply influenced by India per se until she went. And I think she was surprised by that. She had wanted to go and she loved to travel. But I think prior to India, her, her love of folk art and craft was more European and perhaps uh, Mexican, South American. It was not Indian. And um, she, she dressed in 
um, Spanish gypsy skirts and Spanish embroidered blouses and had a big sort of Toreador hat. And, uh, you know, was that was her identity when I first knew her. I mean, when I was little, before she went to India. But when she, when she reached India and began to understand the cultures there, uh, she really became besotted by that and realized when she was given her first sari to try on that that was the most co comfortable gar garment she could wear. And so she never wore anything else for the rest of her life. That's all she wore, um, was a slip and a blouse and a sari, even when working on the potter's wheel. So yeah, uh, that's really interesting. So the impact of India on her persona is well known, especially with regard to the way she dressed, as you mentioned. Um, can you offer greater insight in how that first trip to India impacted Beatrice Wood's life and work? Was there an immediate influence on the way she worked with clay, the glazes she used in her forms that she made, or her two-dimensional work? No, I don't think so. Um, I think Beatrice's style was already established. I think what Beatrice, um, the work that Beatrice made after going to India is in many ways similar to the work that she did before. Yes, she employed folk idioms in her work, but she always had. Uh, and so there are aspects of the folk art and she collected extensively Indian folk art uh, when she was there in the same way that she had uh, uh, collected Mexican and Spanish and French uh, folk art and Romanian and Hungarian before that. And there are elements, folk elements that are similar in many different fields of art, which Beatrice was the first person to, to state. So um, yes, I can see in her works of art that she made I can see pieces from her collection that are reflected in that, in those. Um, but I, no, I don't see them particularly Indian. She doesn't have Indian gods and goddesses in her work. She doesn't have things that are particularly, not much anyway, she doesn't have things that are particularly, you could say that's Indian and not um, South American or, or Mexican or, 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 or Spanish or whatever, Croatian. You know, uh, if, there are aspects of sculptural folk art that are similar. Um, and then her own style really was established in Paris and New York. Um, their graphic style in the period of working with Duchamp. And that remained throughout as well. That was something that was her, that never changed. Um, I mean, it may have adapted, and she always grew but it still had at its core something that's always recognizably Beatrice. Right. Yeah. Um, so Beatrice Wood was part of your life following her first trip to India and during her second trip. Um, had you begun your studies by this time and how knowledgeable, how knowledgeable were you about India? Did you travel to India prior to when you joined? No, her? no, no, no. I was in by, I was just, I was just 19. Um, <laughs> And I arrived in India on my 20th birthday. I got there overland by local transport, as I said, and I met Beatrice in Delhi. Um, she flew there. Uh, the, no, I had spent a year studying India and I had been a mediocre student prior to that, prior to Beatrice's suggesting I come with her. I began to take courses in Indian art history, Indian religion, Indian history in different departments you know, art history in the art department, religion, the religion department, et cetera. Uh, and I found that there were, this was at the University of Denver in Colorado. And I found that there were very fine scholars of India in the different departments and they didn't know one another. They'd never met because they were distinct departments. And I began taking courses in all these departments, turned from a really quite a mediocre student into a straight A student overnight um, because of the interest in India, because I was able to find a country that drew together all my diverse interests. I am really a lateral thinker rather than a uh, linear thinker. I like the ways that things interrelate. Beatrice called me her egghead. And um, so uh, regularly, and uh, 
I was just as interested in history as I was in art and art history, as I was in religion, as I was in cultural studies, sociology, uh, political science. You know, they were all, to me, they all merged in, in a people. So whereas before I was distracted by not knowing what to focus on, by being given India, I could study it from all those different facets. And I, be, I, I the university allowed me to do an interdepartmental major in Indian studies. So yes, I had studied it intensively, but I'd never been there. And being there is very different than studying it from outside. I was prepared. I had no culture shock when I got there. I was prepared as much as I could be. And I was a completely unprepared uh, for the level of kindness, generosity, thoughtfulness, remarkable creativity, uh, tremendous encouragement of what I did through Beatrice's friends, but also just randomly meeting people anywhere. And that is what Beatrice had found. And that was what inspired me. But there's more I need to say. And I, I know you have questions to ask, but this is something that is fundamental to understanding Beatrice uh, and what she taught me and insisted from the very beginning. I spoke about Beatrice's honesty, uh, but also Beatrice was a person who, who believed in, in towing the straight line. Even though she was frivolous, she, was, she had remarkable ethics. But within that, and I I don't know whether this is something that is so Beatrice that it had nothing to do with Dada, the movement that she worked so closely with, with uh, Marcel Duchamp, or whether it was something that was influenced by Duchamp and the others. But what Beatrice taught me is that nothing can be called art and or not art. Everything is worthy of looking at considering, even revering if you're drawn to it, to certainly to documenting it. So when I went to India through Beatrice's tutelage, I, she taught me to look at everything and often to look at things that Indian people more often than not would, would not ever consider as being worth, worthwhile, as being valuable to to see. And what Beatrice, we traveled in Paris together. We'll talk about that later, uh, perhaps. But seeing through Beatrice's eye, because she saw everything, her eyes were open. And what she taught me was to open my mind and my heart to what was there. So I saw things in India that would, you know, I've often said it would be kind of like someone coming into your house uh, Rachel, and, and liking your wastebasket and saying, hey, that's a really great wastebasket. Where'd you get it? And you'd say, what? My wastebasket? You like my wastebasket? You know, what about this, you know, sculpture? And I'd say, well, actually, I really do like that wastebasket. Can you tell me more about it? That's the attitude that Indians largely had towards the work I was doing through Beatrice's um, encouragement. And then over the years, those items that I did notice, that I did find to be remarkable by my standards as an outsider, have now been collected, are now in museums, or not because of what I did, but that's, you know, there's been a change in attitude in India. And so I, I think it's important to have stated that because that's the quality of Dada. You know, that's the, the aspect of Duchamp taking a urinal and turning it upside down and putting it in uh, exhibition that was so shocked people. But he was trying to let people look, encourage people to look at things for what they are rather than only what they represent to us without thinking. Hmm. You know, this is a urinal. Well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's more than that or whatever it might be. And so Beatrice taught me that, and it's something that is the mainstay of my career and what I do. Um, not urinals, but although I've used them up on occasion, but um, 
but uh, looking at art or looking at the creativity and the productivity of humanity as much as possible without judgment that this is or isn't valuable. If it's valuable to that person, then it's valuable. And um, yes, I said that the wastebasket might not be valuable to you, and, 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 but it still is, has a function. You know, you throw things in it and you use it and you empty it then. So it's that, that's a value that still is there. So it's looking at not judging. Beatrice didn't judge. She, she was astounding in that. And almost everyone I know uh, is very judgmental. So I have throughout my life tried to peel away those layers of judgment that are taught to all of us by all of our media and by our families and by our communities, you know, is that this is right and that is wrong. This is good and this is bad. Beatrice would say, mm, open. And that might be a Krishnamurti thing too. Mm. You know, so that may be, when you ask the question about India, mm, yeah, maybe, mm. but it's not your typical Indian. Right. Beatrice was introduced by remarkable Indian uh, leaders of the crafts movement uh, into meeting craftspeople, meeting artists, meeting artisans, as, as I was through her. And I, I know that handling those pieces, seeing them um, affected her, but I don't think that it particularly affected her art per se, other than um, the fact that I think it was her humanity. It was the effect of how those people, what, what the heart, the, 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 the humanity, their humanity, that's what affected Beatrice most in India, um, was seeing people in very impoverished conditions who still had tremendous dignity and would do whatever they could to rise above their uh, the inequities. That's what Beatrice saw and and um, really cherished, and that's what she taught me. Great. Um, Beatrice Wood was also a collector of folk art and brought home many treasures from her time in India. Can you speak to her process of collecting? Was there a certain type of craft or work from a particular region that she admired most? No. Sorry. No, it was whatever she saw whatever she liked. And that there's no way to define, to answer that question because it was Beatrice's um, own eye and taste. She collected what she could afford and what she liked. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, no. I, Beatrice loved whimsy. She loved um, color. She loved form. She liked uh, the strength within form the strength of design, uh, but it could be in anything. And the aspect of uh, India that so impressed her, that has impressed me for these last uh, 50 years, is the ability of Indians to bring beautiful design into every aspect of things that they create. So tools are carved lovingly, plates are made beautifully, uh, if it's for an offering, if it's for eating, uh, you know, textiles are extraordinary. And I think those sorts of things um, impressed her deeply, but she didn't employ them other than collecting them for herself uh, in way, what way she could. She didn't have a chance to travel that much into Indian villages or that much off the beaten track. So she got whatever she could. Uh, it, it, she, you know, she wanted to travel more than she could, but she was on a job. She was lecturing and she didn't have anywhere near as much time as she wanted. Hmm. And so you've spent time with Beatrice in Ojai, India and Europe. Uh, how did your relationship with her evolve over the years? When I first met Beatrice, I was certainly one of the young men as in young men in chocolate. And I had the quality of having a lot of chocolate in my blood since my grandfather and great-grandfather were chocolate makers. So I, I may qualify for that more than most uh, or did qualify when I was young. Um, 
certainly Beatrice was always flirtatious. Uh, and certainly she always flirted with me and I loved it. I just loved it. Uh, and when I um, brought my, the love of my life to meet her, uh, I call her Hi, her name is Helene. And at that point was Helene Wheeler. Um, Beatrice um, loved her, just saw what I saw in her and encouraged our relationship, but also had great fun playing off of the fact that here was a young woman um, that I was enamored with. And so she would always call hi the other woman or uh, would call herself the other woman. And, you know, and so she became our um, maid of dishonor in our wedding. Uh, that was her term. Uh, when hi and I moved to London, uh, so this is several years after we hit, Beatrice and I had been in India together. When we moved to London for me to do my PhD, remember Beatrice called me her egghead, uh, on Indian, uh, how will I say that? Uh, Indian art, we'll say, um, but I study art from all different facets, if you remember. So um, then Beatrice, the next year, uh, was invited to be the uh, uh, guest of honor at the opening of the uh, Pompidou Center, the Bo what is called the Beaubourg, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Paris, that had been being constructed for a number of years. And its opening exhibition was a gigantic, uh, the largest retrospective ever done of Marcel Duchamp. So it was natural that Beatrice was there as a guest of honor, and Beatrice invited Hai and me to join her. So we were living in London at the time. We flew to Paris. Um, I found us a small hotel on the left bank that was very inexpensive. Beatrice was delighted. Uh, her budget was low at that point. She didn't have a lot of money. And uh, we spent uh, a week or 10 days, at least a week, um, there together before the museum opened. And being with Beatrice in Paris, where she had grown up as a child, was life-changing. It was remarkable because she remembered it the way it was and would describe what it was like to be in, um, you know, different, to, you know, we'd walk along the street and she'd say, oh yes, over there, there used to be a, a puppet master that would have his marionettes. I remember um, just sitting next to him when I was a little girl and how wonderful it was. Or over there, you know, that was, that was the, a restaurant that Sarah Bernhardt used to come to. And I remember she was older than I was, um, but I remember, you know, she still was the talk of Paris or, you know, things like that. Or she'd say, you know, down that road there, there were always people, you know, now people dress so boringly, but back in the year when I, when I, years when I was here, people dressed in regional costumes and they would come in from the villages and there'd be women in peasant skirts and wonderful clothing and it was all different and everybody was so colorful and I, I miss that. Or we drove through the Bois de Bologna in Paris and she said, um, you know, I remember she told this to Hai and me uh, and we were just, we were just amazed. She said, you know, I remember uh, riding on a horse side saddle through that that uh, that path through the trees over there with a count uh, and we said, you, you rode with a count? He said, oh, yes. She said, yes, he was very in love with me. And, and the way that he would um, uh, uh, carry me, pick me up off my side saddle and hold him to me, I thought that he would, you know, marry me and um, run off with me. But of course, he was married. And anyway, it was France. And, he, he, you know, he was a Frenchman and nothing ever had, came of it. But, you know, and so we were just amazed. And then the other thing was that when we were staying in this little um, hotel on Rue Jacob in the left bank, she, I would get up early in the morning before she and I were up and would go walk around and find galleries because even then, uh, you know, we're talking about 1977, I believe, you know, she was quite elderly in her 80s and was, um, it was hard for her to get around. She had bad rheumatism, arthritis. And so I, we didn't want to just wander. That wouldn't be good for her. Uh, so I would go and find galleries that I thought she'd be interested in and come back. And then we'd say, okay, Beatrice, we'll, we'll go on. She was just floored 
at how good I was. She thought I could just find them by instinct, but of course I had. <laughs> and then we'd go into these galleries and or shops or whatever, import stores. And the things she would see that I would not have noticed that, you know, she would go directly to the most remarkable work of art in the rest, the rest of it. She had the, the ability to, to weed out that which was truly astounding. And uh, I, I, I kept always learning through her eye um, and through her experience. And then of course, there was the opening of the Bouborg, uh and of the Pompidou Center. And on that night, uh, the prime minister Giscard d'Estaing was there and Beatrice was really faded and we were with her. And all these um, artsy fartsy types were there, you know, all with their cocktails and their drinks and they weren't looking at the Duchamp exhibition at all. And Beatrice was, would have preferred to just be able to look at the Duchamps and, uh, but we, we had quite a good time. And uh, Madame Duchamp was there. That's uh, Marcel Duchamp's uh, wife, uh, Tini. And she and Beatrice were good friends. We met for dinner and lunch a couple of times with Beatrice as well. And uh, I said to Beatrice, uh, isn't she, I mean, isn't there, an, isn't it odd for you to meet um, uh, her, her, his wife? And, she, you know, you're his lover. And she said, oh, uh, you know, I'm the mistress. She's the wife. There's nothing as dead as a dead love affair. It's fine. We're good friends. And they were. And that was pretty great. Uh, and then I, about nine months later, we invited her to come visit us from Ojai, to fly and visit us from um from uh, in London, and she stayed with us for a week there. That was wonderful. Actually, actually, I was going to show you some of that work, but that would be in the other place that we were going. Can I just take you there right now? You asked me about uh, being with Beatrice in other uh, areas than India and Ojai, and I had told you about being in Paris, but also she came to London to visit us, and I we've moved uh, in our house to the area where we have all the Beatrice Wood um, sculptures behind us and, and, and pottery. But I also have here, so Beatrice, I didn't say this, but when I was uh, oh, 18, that first year uh, sitting at Beatrice's feet and or sitting on that uh, love seat with her, with that sculpture behind us, she talked about Duchamp and said that he had encouraged her to uh, draw and to paint in his studio and that he had, he had really helped guide her path and helping her to understand what worked and what didn't work as an artist for her. And, I, and she said that she, as I asked her, she said she'd drawn quite a bit during that period of time. And I said, well, Beatrice, where are those? And she said, oh, I don't and I said, no, Beatrice, really, you, you keep everything. And she did, she was a pack rat. I said, Beatrice, um, wh wh where are those? And she said, oh, I, 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 I said, Beatrice, really, you must have kept some. And she said, well, you could check that trunk over there. And there was an old Spanish trunk she'd gotten in Spain that had been covered with leather studded with brass, but the leather had, had been outside in Ojai for 25 years. And um, it, the leather had all gone away, but it was just wood with little brass studs on it. On top of it was one of her large sculptures of a, of a woman, a great sculpture. And I picked that off, it was heavy, and put it on the ground and opened the trunk. And inside there were lots of drawings and paintings. Um, that she had done back in 1917, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And I was just like floored by this. And so I said, Beatrice, there have got to be more. There, there must be more. And she said, well, I don't know. And I said, can I check your house? And so I went into her house and started pulling out her closets. <laughs> Honestly, it's rather bold of me. And I found, a, I don't know, about 150 drawings and paintings in total, which I then took to Denver to try to interest the uh, Denver Art Museum in, in displaying because, you know, but I was only 18 and they didn't give me the time of day. So those drawings and paintings, I had bought a portfolio I brought back and gave to Beatrice um, during my, that was my uh, sophomore year in college, during my Thanksgiving break. Um, and they remained there until Francis Nelman um, 
uh, called Beatrice, came out to meet her and asked if she had any of her work from that period. And she pulled out the portfolio and then it's history. And uh, so at any rate, the reason I'm telling you this is that when, so Francis had encouraged Beatrice to draw and to, to start drawing again. And so had I, I've been so excited by it. So when she came to, Den to London to stay with us, she began drawing. So when she, what I, we have, among other things, is Beatrice's uh, letters. That this was her letter of acceptance from when she came to uh, London, that she was going to come and she was going to, uh, you know, run off gladly to see me. She was an old woman there. And then I, with my two women, you can see, um, would be ac accepting her. And then she, I would go from one bosom to the next, she says. Now, this is a woman in her mid 80s. And um, then um, she says in this one, they met at the wharf. So this is me. I hope we, I don't even know if you could show this on, <laughs> but this is me, me meeting her at the wharf. And then the three of us are all entwined. Okay. So that was her acceptance letter. But then when she was there, she drew constantly. So there were um, drawings of me in my. Um, chair, I had a Tone chair that was a curved leather, I mean, curved wood uh, rocking chair, uh, or there was Beatrice and uh, Hi and me going through the streets listening to Stravinsky, and she had been at Stravinsky's opening of the Rites of Spring in Paris, and I was playing it on, I had the first cassette deck, I mean, not cassette, what are they, um, eight track in my car. And she'd never heard music in a car like that. And she was just spellbound and talked about that. And this is, you know, me with Beatrice. Uh, she was drawing these when she was in our house and she draw, drew all the time. This is what she thought would be a good stained glass of high and her and me. And um, then when she um, left, she fell in love with our cat, Moses. Uh, and so she did, this, which is Moses crossing the Atlantic, um, most, Mr. Moses, king of cats. And these are the kinds of letters. I have bins of these illustrated stories made by Beatrice that are just fabulous. See, there we are on the streets going through and listening to Stravinsky. Um, and these are all the experiences. And then when she's leaving and she had to go through customs, and how awful it was and going upstairs and downstairs uh, in the airport, you know, and she was an old lady, so it was hard for her to move and they didn't provide her with a wheelchair. And, um, you know, and so then she's back home and um, she realized, she said that Moses, the cat, went back with her and that uh, he would, uh, was, would need to come back to us. So she sent him home, but of course she didn't. So there are many, many ones of those. I also have right here to show you one of my real treasures. The only thing that I have from that first time when I was looking through Beatrice's trunks, she gave me. Um, I refuse to take any of the others and uh, they've become major parts of the collection at uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art among elsewhere, others. But this is a little book that Beatrice made in 1926 and it says, ah, mon grand ami H.B. Rocher, Pierre Rocher, uh, to whose encouragement I owe the fun of drawing, Bea, 1926. And she gives her address, it's 42nd, uh, 42 West 50th Street. And then inside it says, uh, Desain, Bea, New York, 2526. And then there are, inside it says, uh, c'est mes trois amis, my three friends, Marcel, Pierre, and Walter, Walter Ahrensberg. And then there's a line drawing, which is just priceless. And then inside, there's one more line drawing. And uh, it's of a portrait of Beatrice, done in 26. And then the rest are photographs of the paintings that I discovered in the portfolio that were all the ones that she had done, but these are when she had first done them. And so this is a real treasure of treasures. Um, and so, and there are lots in there. Anyway, so that's, um, so when we were in Paris, we saw Jules et Jim, the film, uh, and 
She had never seen it. And she was scandalized, even though it was supposed to, it's made by Pierre Rocher, or written by Pierre Rocher, and was supposed to be based on the menage a trois, fictional menage a trois between her and uh, uh, Rocher and Duchamp. Um, she really didn't like the movie at all and felt that, um, oh, I wish I was here, I'm going blank on the woman who played a famous a French actress that played her said, she was a bitch, I was never a bitch. <laughs> so, <laughs> and we, we had a wonderful time. So that said, then we were in New York in the 90s together. Um, uh, you know, when she was very old, right before she died at the time of her retrospective, and we walked all again, I took her to places, galleries, we walked around, we went to Park Avenue, and she said, uh, looking at Park Avenue, she said, but where are all the parks? And she remembered it from her childhood, uh, when uh, Park Avenue, instead of just being two big boulevards going down with a strip in the center, was actually parks um, all the way down it. So that was, there were you know, and going with her to the Met, oh my God. And going to the tribal section, the Rockefeller collections, you know, the um, Michael Rockefeller, uh, uh, Southeast, A um, Southeast Asian tribal collections was just astounding. Be again, because of what she saw, I learned vicariously through her. So these are the pieces behind me that uh, Beatrice, um, uh, that we have from Beatrice. One is our wedding chalice. So. When we were married, uh, Beatrice gave us this and we drank mead out of it. Um, and uh, she, as I said, was our maid of this honor. When we were married, um, she gave us this as a wedding present to begin with, these two chalices that she made. And when Hai and her mother were opening them and um, her mother, Hai was opening them and her mother was putting um, little numbers on each one she, her mother turned, who did not have that kind of sense of humor, turned over this one. And as you can see, it said, what a shame you married the wrong girl. And she was just scandalized that that was in there. Just, she didn't think it was funny at all. Um, when Beatrice was really elderly, she couldn't travel anymore and particularly not overseas. And she really missed it. And uh, so I traveled vicariously for her. I became a fairly good photographer uh, for her in a way so that I could photograph for her to show her the villages that I visited, um, the, the, the crafts that I found, the remarkable women's art that I was able to discover in India um, and the books that I've done for the exhibitions. But I really, you know, she, I always brought my photographs first back to her. So one time um, in Portobello Market in London, I, um, excuse me, I bought uh, this tribal comb from Borneo. And uh, I knew that Beatrice would like it. And I gave it to her for Christmas just before, when she was 102, uh, the Christmas before her 103rd birthday. And she wrote me a illustrated letter um, and she wrote descriptions of, you know, effusing all over it and how fabulous it was. And then she said that she was going to make us something based upon this. So right up here um, was after she was, had turned 103, Beatrice made this, which is, as you can see, a very large ch chalice um, with figures that are inspired by the comb that I gave her. And that to me is one of the more uh, important and precious things that we have. And just the thought that someone who is 103 could make, could conceive of something as magnificent as that. And we, we love it, we cherish it. So what I do, what I work with is I document folk art and craft, tribal art like these doors. Um, but for me, everything is worthy of documentation because of Beatrice's influence. So for example, right here, um, this is a piece that I have up there because it looks um, like it's a marvelous sculpture. And I have it as sort of a goddess 
figure up there, but truly it is a spatula, right? And it's just so beautifully made of bronze that, you know, it's things like that that I, I really love. Through Beatrice, um, my doctoral dissertation was a book uh, dedicated to Beatrice and several of my books are on uh, terracotta art, like the ones that we saw when we were there together. So it's a potter's art uh, about vessels, but also sculptures. Um, I did a book on uh, women's art in India with Rizzoli. So I've been fortunate enough to have lots of uh, good publishers that are, um, you know, allow me to show. And I, what I'm trying to do is give voice. And this is again through Beatrice, give voice to the women of India. She wanted that. It was important to her. It's important to me. So I, I tell their stories. I talk, I interview women and I document their art and what they are about. Um, because otherwise they're misunderstood as Beatrice said. So through that, then I did another book on that, uh, Daughters of Indiana, book on Sonobaya. These two, Beatrice wasn't alive for. She was for those other two I showed you. I have other books too, but she would have so much loved this work of this woman who, who created art in isolation, uh, sculptures that were just, um, you know, she wasn't trained as an artist and this is the interior of her house. I mean, look at that, it's just fabulous. Beatrice would, would have loved that. And so I'm, whatever I do, I'm inspired by her and through her. And I give her, always give her credit to, you know, in all of my books, I, how, how could I not? I've just finished writing my um, memoirs of 50 years in India. And there's, you know, Beatrice is a, is a chapter in there and also through, you know, continued through the book because I think what she gave me, what she gave so many of us, I'm one of many. Uh, yes, uh, Francis and I took that, what she offered us and made careers out of it. And not everyone has done that, but many, 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 many people were influenced by her. And what a remarkable woman. Uh, when I was young, there was an artist living in Ojai named Guy Inyo. He taught at Thatcher. He said that when he was a young man in Paris, Beatrice was, the, was acknowledged as the most beautiful woman in Paris. She was beautiful. She was entrancing. She was exciting. She was funny. I mean, her wit was legendary. But again, it was her wisdom. It was her insight. It was her extraordinary intelligence. I, I did a series of interviews of Beatrice um, in 1986, when she was 93. At that point, she was reading, uh, uh, every month she got 27 new periodic periodicals that she read cover to cover. And they were everything from um, art magazines uh, to uh, the Pravda magazine and the, uh, the Communist Manifesto for, you know, for Red, uh, uh, Red China at that point under Mao. Uh, but also the John Birch Society manual or whatever it was, the journal, because she felt that she should be informed and look at everything from all sides. So she looked at Republican and uh, de Democrat uh, treatises. She read everything. And I mean, to just have a conversation with Beatrice was so totally thrilling. I, she, she just, she was astounding. So I credit my life and who I've become, and who I am, to be a Wu. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Stephen. I think you've, you've answered our last question. Um, so it's been so great to have you. Thank you. I, I, I have one quick question. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it may not be a quick question. <laughs> um, Steve, I really, it, I, I really love that you share the, the the deeper Beatrice Wood, the the, 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 the honesty, the ethics, the, everything that Beatrice Wood, um, and this is my, my, my question is, people understand Beatrice Wood on different levels, 
And there was a there was a sort of a common understanding of Beatrice Wood that is very light and um, fun and happy, but it's not that the the, the Beatrice that you knew and the, that was the very heart of her. Um, why do you think that is? That did Beatrice Wood did she preserve that for the people that she felt she should share it with? Was did she which which. The, 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 the deeper, more complex, the, 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 the Beatrice Wood that had deep ethics, the honesty, the... It, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't hard to find that depth. She didn't hide it, but um, she, she, was, she had such a great sense of humor yeah. and such, was so theatrical that she enjoyed and she loved um, roughing up the status quo. So, you know, when I was uh, 18 and first working for her, driving her downtown to go to the markets or whatever, the arcade in Ojai, she would um, introduce, we'd be walking down the street and she'd say, oh, this is Steve Heiler, my gigolo. And she just loved it. She loved provoking people to think outside what they believed. Uh, and that's how she used her humor. But beneath it, it I, I think all the people that, that knew her saw that depth. I think that she's known now at, for her humor and her frivolity more by people who didn't know her as well. Um, and it's, we all loved it. It was great. We, we loved her, but the, that, that's not what defined her. Anytime she had a conversation, she would talk about the horrors of war, for example. I mean, she would bring that up all the time or, or politicians that were, you know, corrupt or, or, or misguided. She went immediately into that. Um, and not just with me, I was with her hundreds of times when visitors would come off of the street, so to speak, that she'd not met before. So I, 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 I watched her do that okay. with countless visitors. There's another thing though, there's another misunderstanding about Beatrice that, that um, Hi, my wife likes to, to point out is that there's a kind of myth about Beatrice in Ojai and elsewhere of her being sort of an earth mother type. She would be very offended by that and would think that it's absolutely ludicrous. Beatrice was not an earth mother type. She was far different than that. She had tremendous depth, but, um, but, but, but she, she, was, she really wasn't that other. She, it was, her frivolity was also, it, it goes back to the, to the Dada thing of challenging everything. She challenged everything. Um, Earth mothers don't do that. Earth mothers are grounded. Um, Beatrice certainly was grounded in her ethics, but she was so open. She was wide open uh, and, and versatile as you could possibly be. And, and my other question is, you, you, know, you, you, you talked about um, her, her ethics and her, the, the importance of honesty in her life, living this on stuff. And I, I know she made a big impression on you about that. Did she ever give, give you information about the roots of that, where how that developed, how she developed as a person to be who she was? I, without question, um, the work of Krishnamurti had a profound effect on her and the other theosophical philosophers that she met and talked with. But I think, I really do think that there was an aspect of Dada. Mm -hmm. you know, now that you're asking, it's a really good question uh, that it's that, 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 that point of questioning everything, of not accepting the status quo, of believing that there was, could not be a right answer, one right answer, that one must come back because she described Duchamp as a very ethical human being too, a very fine human being. So I think that there was that quality. I think she was mentored by, by Marcel Duchamp and by others that she admired. And she really was always hurt by deception, by people who were dishonest or people who were shallow. 
and her autobiography is filled with stories of that, but also in talking with her, she would be very upfront about her own trustingness and culpability uh, in the face of um, people who would otherwise uh, try to use you or, 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 or use her and or manipulate her. Uh, in the same breath, I don't think she regretted anything. She didn't, she didn't live, you know, her life was her life and it was what she, who, who she was and what she had done. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you joining us for this and, and sharing this, this who, who Beatrice Wood, um, I, I like to say who Beatrice Wood is because you know, I, 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 yeah, yeah. she's still very much alive as far well, as I'm I'm, I'm so grateful that you're doing this series. I think that these, this is something that you can do in the pandemic. You know, it's, it's what gave you the, the insight to do it, but I think it's such an, it, it, so many times art comes out of either isolation or confusion or, or threat. And what you are doing, you two, um, both, you know, both of you, Rachel, and uh, both of you, Kevin, is creating a new expression that hasn't been done before. And that is an invaluable record, I think, really is. So more power to you. And may you find others you know, that can come forward. I want to see them all, you know, uh, see the, see the other interviews that you do. It's, it just, it's very exciting.